Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. Harry dialed Emily's number for the umpteenth time, but to no avail, she didn't answer. She promised to let him know when she got there, and not a peep. How could this be? Well, yes, his beloved was never distinguished by neatness and commitment, but in such a situation, he even called the airport. The plane he put Emily and her friend on had flown on schedule, landed safely, and after that, both girls had seemed to vanish. Neither one of them answered their cell phones. He didn't want to let his beloved go on this trip. He persuaded her to wait for his vacation and then fly together. But no, alone in a foreign country, because anything could happen. He rushed around the apartment for the second day, dialing Emily's number, then Emily, then her friend, but the answer was silence. Why do you keep looking for the fifth corner? At least go eat a proper meal. His mom called him irritated. How do you not understand? I'm worried if something happened. The son replied, I see, it happened. The girls went out. What's so surprising? It was their first time out. What have they seen here but their shop? Not to mention their town. Well, they've gone out and they're right to enjoy themselves. Why do you say that, mother? Harry was snapping at me. Why should a man be suspected of every mortal sin? Who's talking about sins? I'm talking about going out in the ordinary sense. Sightseeing, swimming, sunbathing. It's all new, it's all different. It's not up to you, and rightly so. Let Emily have her fun. She'll be calmer from now on. They say that he who has not had a good time in his youth will go mad in his old age. Do you want that? Don't you know any other way of things? Does a man have to go out, either in his youth or in his old age? You don't know of any that don't go out at all. Harry was irritated, anxious, and then his mother said such things instead of calming him down. Of course she hadn't liked Emily or Mary either. From the beginning, but that wasn't a reason to talk down to people. I know all about it. I never went out much. I never had time. And I'm not that kind of person, but things happen. Ethan in the front yard, he married his Kathy right out of high school. Everything seemed fine, in 20 years already had a second child, but in 40 she got a rash under her tail and went on a bender so that she forgot her husband and children. It's good that at 40, the children are already adults, but it can be worse. We have such a Clara at work, she told about her sister-in-law. You could listen to stories about mom's friends and their relatives all day and night, but Harry was sick enough. What did he care about someone's sister-in-law? When his favorite girl disappeared somewhere and where in Turkey? They remembered the horror stories they'd heard somewhere about girls who'd been kidnapped and sold into slavery. It was Mary who confused her, dragged her off to some unknown place. In some ways, his mother was right. It was necessary to send this friend away at once, literally forbid to communicate with her. He thought, knowing perfectly well that it was useless to forbid Emily anything. They had met almost a year ago in the store where Emily worked, not in a store, but in a big supermarket. Harry had gone in there to get groceries and saw the girl arranging something else on the shelves. The way she did it, her actions reminded him of some kind of music, as if she were playing a harp, as if she were performing some kind of dance. Every movement was full of such grace, he could hardly take his eyes off the chiseled figure which was not hidden by the ridiculous uniform. A glance at the face, and he realized he was lost. There are times when a girl's figure is beautiful, but her face is so bad. It can be the other way around, and her face was perfect, at least to Harry. He couldn't pass her by, so he went up to her and said, How cleverly do you do that? And he was surprised at his own determination. He'd never tried to meet a girl on the street 
or in a store. Of course, the girls he had 25 years old. There were. But they were former classmates, fellow students, that is, those with whom to get acquainted, specifically was not necessary. Experience. The stranger replied cheerfully, turning to Harry and lighting him up with her smile. And you live near here, I suppose. I've seen you before. Crazy. She had seen him and even remembered him. How could he have missed her? Yeah, I used to come into this store a lot. Yes, I'm in the next block. I come here, but why haven't I seen you? That's impossible. You can't be missed. Harry was really impressed. I'm not always in the store. Sometimes I'm at the cash register, and there's a lot of them. Emily, stop talking. You'll earn your remarks. Threw a woman running past. Oh, sorry. Harry realized. He took a jar from the shelf, pretended to look at it, and talked to the girl about the goods. Are you guys so strict around here? What time do you work till? At 10, I finish. At 11, I leave. From the other side and the service entrance. Without looking, said the girl, and turned around again, suddenly winked with a slightly slanted green eye. We really can't talk during work. I'll meet you, said Harry, tossed the can into the basket, and headed for the checkout. Emily, then, is my one and only. He thought and had no other thoughts. It was only four o'clock in the afternoon, but he was ready to take a watch at the service exit, or better yet, to stand there in the store, watching Emily, guarding her from other men's gazes. But he had to take the groceries home, and it was ridiculous to be on the street, or in the store, in case they took him for a thief and Emily for a fool. No, he's an adult. He should behave like a grown-up, serious man. At home, Mom, Sorting out the shopping was surprised. Where are the carrots? He didn't buy any greens. What's the butter for? We have it. I'd asked you to buy chicken, but you bought some half-finished products. What should I do with them? You didn't buy rice either. And why did you buy sprat and tomato? Twirling the same can in her hands, the woman was annoyed. What am I going to make dinner out of? Your sprat. Mom, I really like sprat and tomato. Today I'll eat it for lunch. I don't need anything else. I'm sorry. Do you want me to go again? For the chicken and everything else? No, thanks. Sending you is a waste of time. I gave you the list. You're so stupid. But Harry wasn't listening. He went to his room and threw himself on the couch, holding the jar in his hands which were touching Emily's hand, and lay there with a blissful smile, waiting for the time to pass. Peeking in the door, Mom, of course, guessed it. It was clear. He's in love. And what kind of sprat do you like? Tell me, please. Not a sprat, Mom, but the best girl. I'll introduce you soon, and soon we'll be married. That's how it is, and send them to the store, and instead of buying everything on the list, they will fall in love with a sprat and lie with it in their arms. The woman grumbled and went to the kitchen. Miranda, not that she was very worried about this behavior of her son. A grown man, what can I say? It was high time he fell in love and got married. But what kind of sweetheart did he find at the store? That store-bought dating never does any good. A friend of mine went to the store, and a man saw her and they got married. How many years has he been tormented with her? And by the way, she's got a bride for her son, Abigail, a wonderful girl, beautiful and smart, a co-worker's daughter. Miranda's known her since she was a kid, just like the rest of the family, lovely family. But no, he went to this store, and who knows how this acquaintance will turn out and it turned out that Harry met Emily after work. Alas, she did not come out alone, but with her friend, Mary, who was probably a pretty girl too, but who disliked him because she prevented him and Emily from really getting to know each other. But Mary, apparently, 
felt it was unnecessary, and quickly left them alone together. And thank you for that. You must be tired. Harry asked, introducing himself. No, I'm very energetic, she answered cheerfully. And anyway, let's be on a first-name basis. We're not at a reception. The girl's cheerful mood relaxed Harry, and together they walked to her house, chatting casually. The young man learned that Emily, like her friend, came from a small town. They wanted to enter somewhere, but failed, so they had to get a job in a store. We didn't want to go home with nothing, but we didn't want to go home at all. There's nothing much to do there. We want to achieve something more, so in a year we'll probably prepare better and go to school, or we'll figure something else out. We're not going to put the cans away until we retire, and we live in this house. We're renting a two-person apartment on the second floor. You see Mary's home. Why don't you come in? Harry, I'd love to come in, but Mary's there, and she's a chatty girl, so we can't be alone together. He didn't want to be alone with Emily, but he didn't think of anything intimate. No, he just wanted to be near her, to talk about everything, to learn more and more about her. Why don't we go and just sit somewhere? Harry suggested, I'm coming from work, and I need to get changed and clean up, and then it'll be too late, because I'm working tomorrow. But the day after tomorrow I'm off, then we'll go out, okay? So they began to meet on weekends, and when Emily worked, Harry, who worked until six, met her in the evenings from work, always with flowers with some small but nice gift. Soon the guy already on Emily's rights, as a young, young man, unashamedly visited their rented apartment with Mary and the girl herself invited to his place. Emily's acquaintance with Miranda also took place. Oh, the potential mother-in-law didn't like her son's girlfriend, and not because she had another bride in mind for Harry. Not because Emily had any conspicuous flaws. She just didn't like it, and that was all, but the woman didn't express her complaints to her son. On the contrary, she praised the girl both in her eyes and behind her eyes, in conversation with Harry and her friends. Wonderful girl, and beautiful and modest, lives far from home, and does not hang around. Behaves decently, works officially, well just fine. She still found one physical flaw in her favorite son, but she told not him about it, but her friend on the phone. Harry overheard his mom saying, Yes, she is beautiful, but I look at people's hands first of all, and they are not beautiful. The palm is wide, the fingers are thick, short, some kind of claws, not hands. Harry heard him, but only grinned. He didn't think Emily's hands were ugly, but rather childlike, touching. Miranda did not give up trying to change her son's mind, but decided to act stealthily. She praised her son's choice and admired the girl's beauty, but she kept telling stories about her sons, allegedly her friends and co-workers. Vanessa, what's going on at home? Her son was so clever and handsome, but he married a guest from some village. She had a baby, and then she got a divorce. Now she wants to take half the apartment from them, and she was such a nice girl, such a sweetheart. Harry was well aware of the implication. Mother, Emily, and I haven't married yet. We haven't had children, so we're not going to divorce. Besides, she's not from the country, but from the city, a resort, by the way, where any apartment is more expensive than ours. I'm not saying anything about your Emily. I'm just telling you about what's going on at work. You and I have to talk about something, but what do we talk about? Not soccer, especially since you're not interested in it, but you could be interested in your beloved's relatives. That's very important too. How is it important? How could I possibly be interested in her relatives? Harry was both amused and annoyed by such talk, but Emma wasn't interested either. She married someone who didn't remember her kinship and now she's been offered a good job, and there are questionnaires and checks. 
and it turns out that this husband's entire family has been in prison five times, and now Emma will not see a good job. How's that for a turnaround? I don't like these turns. Emily had no one in jail, and she herself had no jail time, no lawsuits, and no apartments taken away from anyone. Leave me alone with your friends and their kids. Harry was already angry, in fact, and he didn't know much about his beloved's parents. He just wasn't interested. From her fragmentary phrases, he realized that her relations with her parents were rather complicated, and that upset the girl, and if that was so, then why bother with questions? As if they had nothing else to talk about still, as it was. Every meeting with Emily was a real holiday. She was so positive, so cheerful, so able to lift his spirits. If Harry feared anything, it was that someone would intercept. He had such happiness. Still, she works among people, every day in front of many men, but Emily did not give any reason for jealousy. On the contrary, it seemed that she was afraid of losing her boyfriend. This really raised the self-esteem of the young man who had never considered himself such a dream for any girl. He wasn't trying to bribe the girl to pay her financially for her attention, not at all. He saw that Emily was not the least bit self-serving. Yes, he was a well-to-do man, earning good money, but he had never heard the slightest hint of even the most trifling gifts from Emily. He himself was happy to give her gifts genuinely pleased with her admiration and gratitude. Harry himself did not notice that his savings began to melt like sugar in boiling water. He did not skimp on expensive clothes for his beloved, nor on jewelry. When by Christmas the guy wanted to please Emily with a new branded handbag, and of course, not an empty one he, after counting the money, realized that there was simply not enough money for a model worthy of his beloved. He had to turn to Miranda. Mammy, can you lend me some money for a while? What's wrong? The mother was even frightened when she heard the amount of money she was talking about. You used to have money, didn't you? Where did it go? I had some and it surfaced, but I'll have more soon. Don't worry, I'll close a lucrative project soon. Then what? Your Emily will be back. Sucking you dry like a vacuum cleaner? Mom, don't. Emily has never asked me for a dime. If you're sorry, don't give it to me. I'll find someone else to borrow it from, but it's not worth it to slander someone for nothing. I'll give you the money. I'll give you the money, of course, but think what you're doing. You are going to get married. With what money? You'll have to buy everything for the bride and the celebration itself. The wedding will be in the spring. I'll still have time to earn so much. Don't worry, please. I've never robbed you. Yes, they planned the wedding for spring because they had not yet applied for it, and there was no engagement, but Harry was already sure that he would get the consent, and the ring for that day had already been bought. It had cost a lot of money, but he couldn't tell his mother about it. Christmas was celebrated, and Emily was delighted with the gift. At the end of February, Harry finally proposed to her, got her consent, and very soon after this momentous event, Emily said that she was terribly tired of winter, frost, eternal darkness, and wanted to rest in Turkey. Harry was surprised at this statement. How come without me? I have a vacation in April and we'd plan the wedding for April. Then we'd go on a wedding trip together. How are you going to go alone? Why alone? With Mary, she's on vacation too. Can you trust her with me? We're going for a couple of weeks, so we'll make it a honeymoon trip, like a bachelorette party or something. I don't know what you're worried about. You don't trust me, do you? Why wouldn't I trust you? I'm just scared for you. I don't know what's going on. But isn't it true that sometimes these things happen to single girls? No, I'm not letting you go. Let Mary go alone if she wants to. What are you talking about? 
anything can happen at home and the ceiling can fall on your head. For the first time since we met, Emily sounded annoyed. And anyway, I'm not asking your permission. I'm informing you. That's why I'm going now. Before we get married otherwise, as soon as I become a wife, you won't let me go anywhere. Mary's already gone to get a trip, and now you're starting all of a sudden. You want to hurt my feelings before you leave. Harry didn't want that at all, and realizing that his beloved was going anyway, he decided that he shouldn't spoil her vacation. She was really tired, exhausted for the winter, let her rest, sunbathe, gain strength and new impressions. And now Emily and Mary had gone away, and for the third day there was no news from them. How could this be? I mean, she knows I'm worried. At least send me a text to say everything's okay. I don't need anything else. If she comes, I'll give her a hard time. What if she doesn't? After a week of not knowing, Harry decided that something should be done because two people were missing. But first he decided to go to Emily's work. Maybe some bad news had gotten there that hadn't reached him for some reason. There, in the personnel department, he was given some strange information. On vacation? No, they both quit their jobs, got full pay, said they weren't coming back. I'm surprised you don't know. You're Emily's fiancé, aren't you? I must have misunderstood something, Harry muttered, and went to the house where the girls rented an apartment. The door was open, and some people were dragging tools and materials into the apartment. They were the owners, who said that Mary and Emily had paid them off and had moved out. And who are you to them? The landlady, an elderly woman, asked. No one, an acquaintance, Harry replied. He realized that he really became, or maybe he was his Emily, a nobody. His mother, seeing her son suffering, at first seemed to sympathize, comforted him, said that if something had happened, he would have been informed long ago, and then began to laugh. Well, has your sprat gone to the warm seas? Oh, son, I told you that these store acquaintances do not lead to anything good. I've been sitting on your neck for almost a year, pulling from you. All right, she didn't, you gave her gifts, and you gave her not a trifle. You dressed her, put her shoes on, hung her with gold, who would refuse? You never gave your mother a silver ring in your whole life? Come on, I'm not scolding. You'd better keep quiet. My son was losing it. Don't rub it in, something must have happened. I think she found a richer patron, that's all. Maybe she went to her village, or where she's from. Maybe she lives in the next street. When you meet her with another man on her arm, then you can ask her what's going on. And I don't put salt on it, I put green oil on it. It'll sting at first, but it'll heal your soul wound quicker. Harry understood that his mother was right in some respects, he really knew nothing about his beloved and the one he wanted to tie his life with. Where was she from? Where were her relatives? Although if he had known, what would have changed? Well, he would have come, saw that she was not there, so what? Even if I had met her, I would have heard an indifferent answer. Would that make it any easier? What can you do? You have to move on. Miranda didn't hide her joy at the disappearance of her unwanted daughter-in-law. Cheer up, son. It's certainly a godsend. It would be much worse if you got married, had children, and she disappeared. And so, well, a year wasted and all right, forget it and wait for your happiness. It will not pass by. It was a little inspiring. Except that at the word happiness, Emily's sweet face came to mind, her cheerful laughter. Would he never see her again, his dear bride? Who could replace this girl, who could not be better? And then my mother had a birthday, not an anniversary, because she immediately said that she would not organize a big party. Only her sister and her husband, her late father, her brother and his wife, and a couple of friends. 
And you and me, just eight people, nothing special. We'll sit for a while and that's all, just to meet. We haven't seen each other for a long time. Instead of a couple of friends, only one came, but with her daughter, Abigail. Harry was already a little familiar with this girl, that is, his mom persistently wanted him to meet, and preferably marry her daughter's girlfriend. He liked her a little, but not enough to marry her, and compared to Emily, Abigail was a loser, though she wasn't a bad-looking girl. She was very pretty, but her pretty head with its doll's face, its baby face, was crowned by a too-fat body. Yes, she was such a nice fat girl, simple-minded, trusting, very homely. It is said of such people from childhood that they will be good masters, but did Harry need that? He needed Emily, fun, quick, unpredictable, and loving. And this Abigail, what? Yes, a good hostess. She's probably good at making soup. But loving? No, she hardly knows what that is. At table, of course, he was seated next to Abigail, told to look after her, and Harry dutifully offered her various dishes, served her bread, napkins. He did not know what to talk to her about, so they said nothing to each other except thank you and please. Then the men decided to go out on the balcony to smoke, and Abigail's mother suddenly jerked, obviously pushing her daughter under the table with her foot and making some significant grimaces. Abigail realized, Oh, Miranda, I'm so grateful to you. Such a lovely evening, but I have a headache. Mom, should I go home? I wanted to talk more. What's your hurry? Her mother was upset. I can walk home alone. It's not far. It's late. It's getting dark. So I'll walk. I'd love to walk too, said Harry. He and Abigail went out of the house. He was about to go to his car, but the girl held him back. Don't. You've been drinking. I'd love to walk. It's such a beautiful evening. I'd love to get some air. And her hand slipped under the young man's elbow. I'd love to walk too. Harry smiled, looking at that hand, unexpectedly very beautiful, white, with smooth skin, long, thin fingers and sharp, manicured nails, not at all like Emily, but Abigail was the opposite of his favorite. Well, if Emily was Emily, why not Abigail? We should get married anyway. It's high time she got married. Our mothers have married us off long ago and we shall be a decent couple, and what's the matter? I've had luck before, and I'll never have anything like that. It was uncomfortable to keep silent, so he decided to talk to Abigail a little. You're probably just tired of sitting at this boring party, among people who are not old. He asked with a smile. Why not? Abigail replied eagerly. Your mother organized everything so well, and it's not so old that it's boring. It's just that I've got a bit of a headache. Do you do anything fun without your mom? You know, companies, friends, clubs, and immediately regretted his question. It's clear that Abigail is a homebody. What kind of clubs? And indeed, the girl mixed. Well, with friends occasionally sit somewhere, although no, that I will lie, not really I go somewhere and with someone to have fun, but I do not need it and do not need. I love my home. I love to read, watch movies, do crafts. I'm boring, aren't I? Why not? Harry exclaimed quite sincerely, not at all. You, you're the right Abigail, the right kind of woman for life, for happiness, for family. I suppose that's what a woman should be. It would be worse if you were 25 and running around dancing. I'm already 26. Abigail sighed, and no family. Maybe because I didn't go dancing, where would I have met? I work in a women's collective at school. At the institute, there were mostly girls. They are all married already, have children. So with me, they have no time to meet and no need. But sometimes I'm jealous. The girl spoke without a tear, without any bitterness, 
just telling me. Harry thought that she was not capable of strong emotions, and perhaps that was her good fortune. It's just that my mom keeps trying to fix me up. Abigail grinned. Here's to you, too. I realize my mom's been hinting for a while that you'd be a better choice. Why don't we just humor our moms and get married? I said it, and I was scared. What if she said yes? No, I mean, she's a good girl. Maybe she's the best option, but what if Emily comes back? Abigail, as if reading his thoughts, grinned. Aren't you afraid I'll say yes? I'm not going to say no, but I don't want to do it on the fly. I need to think about it, to talk, to get to know each other a little. Isn't that right? And if you change your mind tonight, I won't remind you, don't worry. I'll just consider it a joke. Here's my house. I'm not inviting you over. I'll come back later, okay? In the meantime, you can call me if you want to talk. You're right, Abigail. You're so right. I'll definitely call, and we'll talk about everything else. Obviously, we're not going to register the marriage right away. That was the end of it. Harry did not go home at once. He decided to take a walk along the street to wait for the guests to leave to avoid questions, hints, and advice from older companions who had lived their lives and knew better. It was better to walk alone, to think without interference. About whom? About Emily, of course. He forgot about Abigail as soon as he said goodbye to her. He thought about his missing lover all the time and was horrified that Emily herself would never know, nor would she want to know how he'd lived all those months, and he'd lived like that, thinking about her all the time. Not about why or where she'd disappeared to, but just so he wouldn't see her, no matter who he talked to, his first thought was always to tell Emily. And now, too, as if he saw her in front of him and asked her mentally, you'll come back and I'll be married. What then? And she seemed to answer, laughing. What's what? You'll be divorced, that's what. He came home when the guests had gone, and his mother was doing the dishes, and when she heard her son open the door, she came running out of the kitchen, asking him questions. What took you so long, Harry? Did you see Abigail off? What did they talk about? Did you go to their house? I saw Abigail off. We talked about personal things, but I didn't go to her place. Harry gave a short report. Oh, well, what did we talk about? Why can't you say a word to your mother? Miranda was upset. I'm curious. I've been dreaming about it for so long. What is it? What were we supposed to agree on in half an hour? We just talked, agreed that we'd call each other, and then we'd see. We haven't planned a wedding yet. It's a little early, isn't it? Well, of course, we should talk first. Although he's not young anymore, it's about time. Don't take too long. To be honest, I dream about it day and night, about your wedding. You will live with us. We have a bigger apartment. Miranda began to outline her plans. Mom, no one's thinking about getting married yet. What are you talking about? I don't understand. Harry really didn't understand why his mother was so eager to marry him. It was quite simple. Or are you waiting for that sprat of yours? Well, I'm afraid the devils will bring it, and they will. Who needs it in the Emirates, or wherever it is? They're gonna get mad, and they're gonna kick your Emily out. And tell me, son dear, will you really accept her after all this? Don't you have any self-respect? I won't let her on my doorstep, and I'll bequeath this apartment to my nephews. No, Mom, that's impossible. Why are you running ahead of the locomotive? No one gets married, no one comes back, no one dies, and you. And so they went to their rooms dissatisfied with each other. But from that day on, Harry and Abigail began to see each other quite often. At first, it was the young man who took the initiative. He realized that it would be difficult for Abigail to be the first to call, to invite to meetings, and without it all communication could stall. But for some reason he didn't want that, 
because it was interesting to communicate with Abigail, and in general, it was calm and reliable with her. They spent the summer beautifully, going to the country on weekends, swimming and sunbathing, picking berries, talking about everything in the world. Abigail didn't have to think about where to find money for another gift or some expensive entertainment. She didn't like restaurants or clubs. Everything was simple, homely, and Harry felt that was exactly what he was missing. Then Miranda announced that it was Abigail's mom's birthday and they should definitely go. Harry didn't think of refusing, especially since he had his own views on the day. He figured that if it wasn't Emily, who cared who was around? Abigail was not the worst option. He bought a ring beforehand, certainly not as fancy and expensive as the one he'd gotten for Emily, but not because he didn't think Abigail was worthy. He just realized that money should be saved, and in the middle of the celebration, he asked for the floor, got down on his knee, and asked Abigail to become his wife. To the applause and joyful tears of both moms, the consent was received. The wedding was performed, and they began to live together in Harry and Miranda's apartment. The mother gave the young couple two rooms, and she herself took the smallest. There was no adjustment of character between the young people. From the first day, they began to live peacefully and quietly, as if they had been married long ago and knew everything about each other. I can't get enough of you. I was Miranda. All my acquaintances complain about their children and daughters-in-law. They have one thing wrong or another. But you are just like Dobes. We are like old landlords, all the talk about what to buy, what to cook, but at best, what movie to watch in the evening, and we are not even 30 yet. How many years to live like this, from breakfast to dinner, from work to home, from home to work? Yes, you can call it stability, but you can also call it green longing. Saved from this routine, memories of her, of Emily, with her would be a completely different life. Soon, and in the measured existence of the young family, came a change. Abigail announced that she was pregnant. This was a great joy, but also a source of great anxiety for everyone, both for the future parents and grandmothers, especially since the pregnancy was quite complicated. And at the ultrasound, it turned out that Abigail was carrying twins. It was a happy expectation of a miracle. Two new people were to appear in the world at once. Harry felt truly happy for the first time in a long time, an established adult man. He loved his Abigail, who had given him such happiness, and was prepared to give him two children. And then the children were born, a boy and a girl. While Abigail and the children were in the maternity hospital, the relatives were choosing names. For some reason, everyone was expecting two boys, but now they had to think of a name for a girl. They thought it would be Ethan and John. Why don't we make her Kathy? Oh no, my grandmother was Kathy. Very hard luck. How about Lucy? Miranda suggested. No, I don't like it. It's a heavy name. Lucy has a difficult personality. How about Lisa? Well, you're the dad. Why don't you say something, suggest it. We went to Harry. He almost said the only woman's name dear to him, Emily, but he bit his tongue in time. As a result, the children were named Jordan and Olivia. Beautiful names, wonderful children. The choice of names, the purchase of the children's dowry, the equipment of the nursery, in all this Harry took a very active part. I feel like the father of the family. And then finally, Abigail and the children were discharged, and his role was suddenly the last. Life revolved around the twins who needed a lot of attention. No one had time for the father of the family. No Harry, an adult and sensible man, was far from resenting his wife and even less jealous of her children. It was just that life had changed unrecognizably. Now he cooked his own breakfast in the morning. His wife slept, exhausted, 
after a sleepless night with the children. Gone were the morning conversations, which, as it turned out, set the tone for the coming day. Gone were the family lunches, the mainstay of their life together, the dinners that relieved the day's tension. What was? There was this. Your shirt. Look in the closet. No? Well, wear the same one you wore yesterday. It's clean. You eat in the kitchen. There's something in the pot. Heat it yourself. I have to feed the kids. You're finally here. Why are you so late from work? I have to go to the clinic with the kids. Don't take your shoes off. Let's go together. And so on. Somehow I coughed. My wife and mother got worried. How did they freak out? Not at all like before. Here's a thermometer. Drink some decoction. Take some mixtures. Put on warm socks. No, not at all. Abigail was worried in a different way. Do you have a cold? Oh, stay away. Don't go past the nursery. Go to the bedroom and stay there. I won't come in, I'm sorry. I don't want the kids to get sick. Even without a cold, he was afraid to go near the children. God forbid you breathe out some adult germ on them. So that's it. He became an extra in his family. Not to talk to someone. Not just sit next to someone and like to reproach no one. What else was missing? Not to complain that his wife gives too much time to the children, but it was dreary and lonely. The vacation was approaching, and Harry realized that it did not please him at all. Not having to go to work would be a joy, would it? At work, at least among people you can talk and joke, but at home, what? No one, in fact, does not refuse to communicate. They ask questions, are interested, but so out of politeness. They don't listen to the answers until the end or run away to the children. The main thing was to see her, to hug her at least once more, and having given his friend his consent, he began to pack. The first thing to do was to report back home. Harry didn't worry much about how Abigail would react to his message. He suspected she wouldn't. Maybe she would be relieved. He decided not to delay the conversation, especially since he was leaving soon. In the evening, when the children were asleep in their room and Abigail was ironing the children's clothes in the kitchen, he asked her bluntly, Abigail, do you think I should go on vacation for a couple of weeks? Would you be okay with that? Abigail, not raising her eyes from the delicate rags she was stacking, said a little surprised. What's there to be offended about? You're on vacation, and you and I can't go yet. Go, of course. Where are you going? To Turkey. A co-worker offered a trip for half price. It won't be too hard on the family budget. All the more reason. Go, of course, I'm not going to object. And Abigail, smiling brightly, looked at her husband. How do you know if she had cried, rebuked him, discouraged him, resented him, maybe Harry would have refused. He loved Abigail and the children, and he didn't want to cause them any trouble. But if his departure wouldn't upset anyone, why not go? As it turned out, it would upset and alarm someone. Miranda heard the conversation between husband and wife. She did not interfere at once, did not comment on what was going on, but later she came upon her son. What are you up to, Harry? Furiously, she whispered to her son, What turkey? Abigail, so here to kill, and you go to warm your belly? But you two are here, and your mother comes almost every day. I don't have to do anything, and I'm really tired. When the children are older, I'll let Abigail go on vacation alone, and we'll manage here, won't we? You will, yes even though you're not familiar with your own children now. Anyway, don't avert your eyes like I don't know why you want to go to Turkey. Didn't you get a message? But that's too much. I didn't get any news, Mother, and don't make up nonsense. Let's say Emily is in Turkey, but where in Turkey? I have no idea. You think I'm going to run all over the country looking for her? You would, and I assure you, it's a small world. 
so you have my word. Don't go anywhere. Stay home with your wife and kids. What kind of vacations are vacations when the kids are small? It won't end well. You won't find Sprat, and you'll lose your family. Abigail, of course, is quiet, patient, but no patience is unlimited. His mother's words had no effect on Harry's decision. He still went on vacation with a friend. Yes, his mother was right. He had hoped to meet Emily, although he did not believe that it was possible. But the truth was for Miranda. The world was too small. When he checked into the hotel, Harry saw a girl of familiar appearance behind the desk. It wasn't Emily, but the face looked familiar, and he realized it was Mary, the friend his sweetheart had left with. He rushed to her, hoping to find out about Emily. But when she came to the counter, Harry couldn't resist. Emily, is that you? With joy and anguish, he said, approaching the girl. Your papers. With a professional smile, said Emily, holding out her hand for his ticket, and with the same smile, without looking at him, said, as if continuing the business conversation, "You can't come here. Come here in three hours. I'll finish. Then we'll talk." Everything was just as it was then, three years ago. Gasping with happiness, thought Harry, going to his room, and she was still as beautiful, light. Cheerful, and loved to tears. Thoughts of Abigail, his mother, his children were gone. It was as if they did not exist in his life, as if he and Emily had parted recently, without having time to change something in their lives. The next three hours lasted endlessly. His companion tried to find out something, but Harry answered in vain, and he went to the beach alone, having achieved nothing. Harry, long before the appointed time, was already standing at the service exit, keeping his eyes on the door from which Emily was to appear. She came out, saw Harry, and flashed him her unique smile. Harry went up to the girl and put his arm around her. Emily, darling, how I've missed you! How I missed you! The girl hugged him too. I was always thinking about you. She whispered. Their embrace was not passionate or strong; it did not feel the heaviness of their bodies, as if two souls met in space and merged with each other. So they stood side by side in silence, as if conversing with thoughts and feelings. Then they separated. They looked into each other's eyes. Why don't we go to a restaurant? Harry suggested. I don't care about restaurants. The girl dismissed him. Let's go to your room. Ordered dinner there. They ordered dinner and the next morning breakfast. They were so happy together that there was no time left even for the clarification of relations. Harry didn't want to disturb the union of souls by asking what had happened, why Emily hadn't come back, what she had been doing all this time. She hadn't asked much either, hadn't reacted in any way to the news of his marriage. Harry felt guilty himself. He tried to justify himself. You were gone, and I didn't care about anything. They told me to get married, so I did. How do you want me to come back now? You're married. You have kids, but divorce is still a thing. Yeah, you know, it's the wife. She's so indifferent. I don't think she'll be upset. A divorce is a divorce. What's the big deal? What about the kids? I'll pay child support. I've been promoted. I think we'll have enough money to live on. Are you coming with me? No, it's not that quick. I have a contract. I have to work till the end of the season. But don't worry. Come on, I won't stay long. Think about it. What's there to do here? You think it's good to be alone all the time? Mary and I have already split up. She's got a boyfriend here. We live apart. We don't talk much, Emily. I swear you'll never regret coming back. They spent the whole week together, but when they were going back to the airport, Harry met his friend. You had a lot of fun, I see. He said with a sneer, either with disapproval or envy. What kind of a hottie did you get? 
former love, and present and future and forever. Harry replied with a distracted smile. Are you going to go on a date once a year? My friend asked. Why should I? She's coming. She promised to come back to the city. She has a season to finish. She has a contract. Harry explained. What about it? And the fact that you've got a family, you've forgotten about that, haven't you? His voice grew colder and colder. What's family got to do with it? There are such acts of civil law as divorce. Don't you know? Harry was already angry at his neighbor's words. I do, and I know what a pleasure it is to get divorced, but you. Think about it. You've got Abigail the gold. What about this one? How did she end up in this hotel? Who cares where she works or how she got there? We love each other. She promised she'd come. And Abigail? What can I say? Yes, Abigail, gold. And that's why I hope everything goes well with her, without too much scandal, without screaming, and without tears. Well, if it does, I feel sorry for Abigail. Two kids after all and here. Oh, stop it. What's wrong with you? I don't know. Stop shouting. It'll be all right. It'll be fine. The main thing for me is to get Emily here, and I'll take care of everything else. Everything else can be taken care of. Whatever you say, I don't think anyone's going to talk you out of it. It's up to you. Just you watch when you come to Abigail. Don't tell me that you've met love, about the divorce, all that stuff. Something tells me that such people don't always keep their word. Shook his head, buddy. Bite your tongue, I beg you. He will keep his word, you'll see. But no matter how strong Harry's confidence in Emily's obligatory arrival was, his friend's words had a grip on his soul. He wondered what would happen if Emily really didn't come. They had called. The girl had said that yes, she was already going. There was a month, a week left to go, but the confidence was shattered. Harry doubted, and every day more and more, he was nervous, lost his appetite, slept badly, irritated, and Abigail as if she didn't notice anything. Her husband said nothing, and she, seeing his condition, offered some drops, decoction to calm his nerves, and only that. She wrote off Harry's mood after the vacation as nervous tension, and she herself was quietly rejoicing at his arrival, telling him about the news, mostly about the children. Sometimes only he caught her testing glance, but he kept silent. Indeed, why upset her before her time? Miranda, on the other hand, could not be deceived. She saw the mood in which her son had returned and guessed the reasons for the change. At first she kept silent, but then, left alone with Harry, she asked him if he had seen his sprat. How is she doing? She's probably coming to visit. Mom, please, whether she's coming or not, whether she's seen or not, let's not talk about it. My son turned away. I'd love to never know anything about her at all, but thanks to you. Anyway, it's up to you. But I beg you not to upset Abigail. After all, she is your wife, your children's mother. You can't change her for this one. Think about it. How are you going to live if you tell Abigail now and break her heart? Remember, I'm on her side, on Abigail's side, and I don't want to know you if you ever mess with that pest again. I ain't gonna break nobody's heart, and I ain't gonna tell nobody nothing. There's nothing to tell, Mom. Stop it, please. It hurts to hear everything you say. Harry was hurt by the fact that no one believed in his beloved, that mate, that mom. Everyone was sure that Emily wasn't coming, that she had spun around again and given up. And he was sure that she would definitely come. There was nothing left to do but hold back, not saying anything yet to Abigail, who had become even more of a stranger after he'd passed two weeks next to the one that seemed to have been made for him. Two days before the season ended, Emily's phone went silent. She didn't answer calls. 
She didn't answer texts, and then her phone was disconnected. She disappeared as if those two weeks had been some kind of dream, and they were, in fact, a dream. He just went on vacation, just met there the one without whom it is difficult to live, but you can, and you can even happily. His children are growing up, his wife loves him, his mother, however, sometimes looks at him the same testing, and sometimes even mockingly. That's what is funny to her. The fact that the son did not work out with the woman he loved, that's how she knows that it did not work out, because Emily may well show up. Harry argued mentally with those around him. The season had passed, the next season had begun and ended, and there had been no word from his beloved. Life was gradually returning to its normal course, and even the memory of Emily seemed to be fading, though it had not completely disappeared. Could he forget the one on whom so much of his life depended? The one who had shown a bright star on a gray, humdrum life. How much I have learned since I met Emily, learned what love is, and what betrayal is, what pain is. And also during this time, had time to get married, to become a father, to learn what is not love. Learn to live without love, only with responsibilities. How hard can it be? But nothing is harder than being separated from Emily. Will she never, ever be in my life again? I can't bear it, I promise you. The unhappy man in love suffered. He knew perfectly well that he would survive. He had already survived it once. And this time he would manage somehow, and perhaps he would meet her again. And maybe even more than once. Christmas was approaching, the first such holiday for children who were about to turn a year old. They decided to celebrate it at Abigail's mother's house. She was ill and couldn't come, so they couldn't leave her alone for the holidays. First thing in the morning, Harry took his wife and mother and children to his mother-in-law's house and returned home to grab some dishes they had prepared, but did not take at once. Left alone in the empty apartment, he sat down by the table, pulled out his cell phone. A couple of miracles, if fairy tales and soap operas were to be believed. No word from Emily, of course. She hadn't answered her phone in months, and she wouldn't now. She could have at least texted for the holiday. Congratulations, happiness in your personal life, but no. Why don't you dial her number yourself? So Harry decided to do it, and he did. Oh my gosh, the phone was answered. The world's most precious voice answered. Hello, Harry, is that you? Who else, Emily? Where are you, tell me? I can't go on without you. I'll go mad without you, understand? He shouted, almost sobbing with happiness. And I'm here, I'm in town. Harry, why don't we meet? I'm staying at a hotel now. I've got a room. As if nothing had happened, Emily said. Tell me the address. I'll be there in a minute, please. But don't disappear again. I'll be right there. My darling, my only one. Forgetting that they were waiting for him at his mother-in-law's house, that he had to bring some more salads, Harry jumped out of the apartment to run, drive, fly to meet his beloved. At some point, though, he pulled out his phone, quickly typed a message, and sent it to his wife. It's all right. Don't wait, urgent business. How Abigail would understand these words, he was not interested. Let her understand as she wants or understand nothing. That was not the main thing for him now. He was on his way to meet the woman he loved, the only one in his life, and they would never part again. He would never let go of his Emily, and his hands were shaking so much that he couldn't write anything else to Abigail, but he wanted to write everything, that they were getting divorced, and that he loved someone else. He didn't write, but fine, it was all the same. Why write, we'll have to meet again and say everything in person, and then her mother will tell her if she doesn't understand something. All right, Emily is here. She's not in Turkey anymore, she's at home here. 
and now I will not let her go anywhere, never and for no reason. He thought, hurrying to Emily's room. Everything would be different now. Everything would be different, just the way he wanted it to be, just as long as she didn't go anywhere else. Emily opened the door for him, still as fresh, beautiful, loved. Emily, I beg you, tell me, what do you want? What are you missing? Anything. Just don't disappear again. Don't ever disappear. I'll do anything for you. Do you believe me? From the doorway, he shouted. Emily was silent and slightly bowed her head, looking at Harry with a smile in which, perhaps, there was deceit and betrayal, but there was also love. And for that, anything could be forgiven. Come on, Harry. New Year's Eve is coming. Let's celebrate it properly, shall we? Without answering, the girl said. Her gaze, the sound of her favorite voice was freezing. Harry hugged his beloved, kissed her, felt her kiss back. Only close to midnight did he come to his senses. Edge of consciousness, Harry heard his phone ringing. He realized that his family was worried, hurt, perhaps angry with him. But what did it matter when he was near his beloved? Absolutely none, and there was nothing to answer him. Not to his mother, not to his wife. Oh, Harry, it'll be Christmas soon. Let's order dinner, champagne, something else. It's a holiday. You can't just sit around all night. It's good not to sit around, but we won't be satisfied with love alone. The menu was next to the phone. They ordered what they needed. I wish that we would never part. Harry made a wish, piously believing it would come true. It was unknown what Emily had wished for, but they spent the night together and were happier than ever. Harry's phone rang a few more times, then went silent, and the next day, the fairy tale began to crumble. Emily informed him that she had to go back to Istanbul. Why? Don't go, darling, but I'm telling you, I can't live without you. Please stay, but not forever, not until spring. I can't stay, Harry. I've been offered a job there that I'll never get here, and I'll never get money like that. So there's no way I can stay, you know. I love you. I need you. But I'm sorry. Why don't you come to my place? I'll come, but I have a job here. And what will I do there? Begging? Sit on your neck? Okay, I'll think of something. I'll talk to you. We'll find you a job. Emily spoke coldly, businesslike, pack your things. Look, my whole life is out there right now, and my life is you. I can't stay without you, Emily. I can't live without you. Please stay, Harry begged. My darling, my only one. The girl softened. I'm sorry, but I can't go back to the store. I can't rent an apartment here. I can't stand this cold. I can't live without sunshine for six months. I can't even do it for you, you know. That's why I'm telling you to get your affairs in order and come back. Emily, I haven't given up hope, Harry. Well, Emily, all you think about is yourself. Can't you live? I was getting angry, Emily. You've had a great life. You've married and had children, and your career's on the upswing. And now you want to have a mistress at your fingertips? That's convenient. And how I'm going to live my life doesn't interest you. I'm telling you I'll get divorced. We'll live together. You won't work at all. But you didn't get divorced. And you share the apartment with your mother. And I won't live with her. And from your paycheck, deduct child support for the two kids, your wife, and maybe your mother. What's left for the two of us? Harry... Don't hold me up. I'm going to miss my plane. You can walk me out if you want, but without the wailing. Harry drove his beloved to the airport. He was so depressed that not that wailing, words could not say. At least don't disappear. Stay in touch. That's all he asked. I'll think of something. I'll be there. We'll be together. I promise. Emily promised not to disappear, said goodbye and left. 
as if vanishing into thin air. It was time for Harry to go home to his family, and he didn't know how to explain his act. What his wife and mother would say was irrelevant. Emily had left. That's what was terrible, and all the others were still there. They wouldn't go anywhere. They'd blow up and that was it. Emily's gone. That's the trouble. And what these people will say or do, who cares? I won't even resist. Harry thought with a grim grin. Miranda was the first to arrive. Merry Christmas, she said dryly. What are you going to tell me about your adventures? I won't tell you anything, Mom. Harry sank tiredly onto the bench in the hallway. You can make something up if you want to. I haven't made anything up, and I don't want to tell the truth. Is Abigail in? Well, it doesn't take a genius imagination. It's clear without your explanation. Abigail, you say? Where else would she be? Or were you hoping she'd gone? I wasn't hoping for anything. Let's not talk about it. I'm exhausted, really. Poor guy, he's exhausted. Are you going to sit in the hallway? Well, sit there. What can I do? Her mother went to her room, and Abigail came out of their bedroom, pale, puffy-eyed, with a drooping face. Harry felt an acute pang of pity for his wife, a sense of irredeemable guilt for her. Abigail, I'm sorry. He slid off the bench, knelt, and tried to grab Abigail's hand. I'm sorry. I don't know how it happened. Don't. She pulled Abigail's hand away. I don't need anything else. I don't have time. And left for the kitchen without even glancing at her kneeling, bowed husband. He sighed, got up, wandered into the room. Well, everything at home seems to have turned out all right. The mother, of course, expressed her you, but even in a lighter form than one might have feared. The wife, but apparently decided to kill with contempt, which is also not the worst option. The pity and guilt somehow subsided. Abigail, to all appearances, didn't really care, that is, when he didn't come and didn't answer his calls, she was probably worried, concerned. Maybe she tried on the role of a widow, but now her husband is back. He is alive, healthy, at home, so everything is normal. If she were really dissatisfied, that is, insulted, offended, killed by his actions, would have left, would have filed for divorce. Well, or scandal raised a real scandal, with breaking dishes, tears, violent explanations, and this, nothing else is not necessary. Well, do not need and please, he is also not going to explain or apologize for the rest of his life. He will live and live as before, waiting for his beloved. He won't disappear for the third time. It didn't work out so well before Christmas. Mostly because of his mother, who looked at her son with contempt, pressed her lips together, refused to eat with everyone, and hissed something judgmental. Abigail also withdrew at first, talking little, that is, almost never communicated with Harry at all. It was hard to live in such an environment, especially since there was such an icing of relatives on Christmas vacation. Even at work, there was no escape from such a harsh atmosphere. If the women wanted to punish Harry in this way and to get some special apology from him, they miscalculated the more his wife and mother turned away from him, the further he himself became estranged from them. He liked walking, though the weather was not favorable for it, but he was sick of sitting at home. Besides, there was always the possibility that Emily would call, and he would not talk to her in front of his own people. But she did not call, and she answered Harry's calls very seldom, referring to her work, but she did answer, and was so affectionate, so sweet in these short conversations. That's what a real woman should be like, and for me it was Emily who was perfect. And Abigail, what? She's a fish, she doesn't live, and she won't let me. I should, I should get a divorce and go to Istanbul to my one and only, already a free man. 
He thought so, but he did not do anything yet and did not even talk to his wife about divorce. It's not that he was afraid. It's just that he had two one-year-old children. Do they divorce people like that? In any case, there will be talk, and here all is conspired to praise Abigail, that is, she and before everyone loved her, talking about what she is nice good, but somehow it was not conspicuous. But now you stick your nose out the door, and some neighbor girl will jump in like a tick. How's Abigail? She's so wonderful. When I see her, I'm in such a good mood. Well, God bless her. Say hello. I went to work, same song. How's your wife? You're lucky. You found the perfect wife. It's like someone's got everyone talking about Abigail. Well, you should have had her. Harry thought with annoyance. Who'd want her with two kids? She wasn't much used to anyone without them. Not only did the constant talk about Abigail spoil his mood, but also the fact that Emily wasn't calling him, and she was answering his calls less and less often. The conversations were getting shorter, and in the background I kept hearing music, cheerful voices. Was our reunion being delayed for a reason? If they intercept my Emily, what then? I had to make a decision. I was also constrained by the fact that there was not much money, at least for the first time they were necessary, and then we'll see. It was unbearable to keep everything inside, but there was no one to talk to. Only Mason, a close friend, he dared to say everything that had boiled up in his soul. Mason lived alone, in a rather large apartment, left by his parents, and Harry at one time even had a desire to rent a room from him, to live separately from his own, but did not dare. Mason was his own man in their house, had been friends with Miranda for a long time, and even seemed to have a fondness for Abigail. He never showed it, though. He was always correct, remembering that she was his friend's wife, but he couldn't bear it now. So Harry decided to pour out his soul to his only friend. I've put the car on sale, and I can get a lot for it, but I have some savings left. I'm going to Istanbul. I can't go on without her, my Emily. Are you crazy? What about your family? Mason was surprised. What about family, Mason? I am superfluous there, in my present condition, you know. I can't look at my mother or my wife, even my children are a burden. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. What am I supposed to forgive? I'm not judging you, but you're doing something bad. Aren't you ashamed? I'm ashamed, but not ashamed because I'm sad. I can't go on living like this. Harry was sure he was right. Then why did you get married? To have kids. How will you look them in the eyes later? Mason realized that he couldn't talk his friend out of it, but he felt so sorry for Abigail and the babies. I think they'll understand. Anyway, when they grow up, I'll tell them this. Never give up on your love. Never settle for less. That may be the best advice they'll ever get. However you get it. No, Harry, I'm not moralizing to you. I'm not a priest. I'm not a teacher. If you want to go, go. I just want to say one thing. Are you sure you're not going to blow it with your love again? How many times has your Emily deceived you? Not again, I hope. And you know, Mason, her deception is worth more to me than any right. And you really don't have to lecture me. I'm not hurting anyone. The kids are young, and Abigail doesn't seem to care if I'm here or not. Look, if you want to go, go, but don't get too cheap. No, I do business with reliable people. They won't cheat. Harry left without understanding his friend's words, without heeding his advice. Mason thought gloomily about how lucky some people were and how the lucky ones did not appreciate their good fortune. Why should he have such luck, he asked. The love of the best woman who gave birth to two wonderful children and he breaks away and goes where? To some hussy who doesn't want to know him. Yes, Mason had a thing for Abigail,
but she was the wife of an old friend, therefore unavailable under any circumstances. And now, even if Harry doesn't get divorced, which he won't, he would come to Istanbul, see what the beautiful Emily was doing there, and return home with nothing, and Abigail would probably take him in. Harry started packing at home, not really thinking about what he would say to his wife, mumbled something about a business trip. Is that so? said Abigail. For how long? But how do I know how things will work out? I'll text you or call you. If things go well and the business trip lasts longer, can I consider myself a free woman? What are you talking about? Harry asked unhappily. Was Abigail starting to realize something? Do you still think I'm a homely clod who can't see beyond diapers and pots and pans? But the truth is, I see and I understand. I know you married me while loving someone else. I thought a life together would make a difference, but you're leaving, you're disappearing. How long do I have to put up with this? I know you sold the car knowing you weren't going on any business trips. Who put that in your ear? Your mother, I suppose, or some of the sympathizers who feel sorry for St. Abigail. Well, listen to them, listen to them. No one blows me anything, on the contrary, everyone tries to assure me that you are a wonderful husband and family man, and you would be like that if it weren't for all this. I understand everything, even why you're lying to me, why you won't come clean and divorce me. Abigail's voice sounded sad, but without tears, she was not going to cry or make a scandal. And why is that? Harry asked. It's very simple. You don't know how your favorite woman will take you. Maybe it will not work out with her, and then you can safely return home, where you will always be waiting for a plate of food and your own woman in bed. Don't be silly. I'm traveling for work. No women. Stop making up nonsense. I'll go and come back. I don't know how long I'll be there. And don't get on my nerves. I want to leave before my mother gets back, or she'll start giving me a hard time. Go on, there's no hurry to get home. Abigail grinned. Harry really didn't delay, took his things, kissed his children, kissed his wife on the cheek, and left without waiting for his mother. He was glad of such good fortune. Miranda would not have been delicate would have said everything she thought about his business trips. Or maybe she'd try to keep her son. That's what she told her daughter-in-law when she got home from work. What do you mean he's gone? Where? Why? What business trips? Why did you let him go, Abigail? What could I do? Lie across the door. Get down on my feet. I still have my dignity. I put up with it because I loved him and hoped he'd love me back, but I guess he didn't. I'll file for divorce, and in the meantime, I'll probably move in with my kids. What are you doing? Why would you do that? Now Miranda was ready to lay across the door, terrified. What will I do without you, without grandchildren? What are you doing? My son's away. I don't know if he'll be back. Are you going to leave too? No, Abigail, don't leave me. The women hugged each other and decided not to part. Abigail was left to live with her mother-in-law. They had been on the best of terms from the first, and Harry's behavior did not affect it at all. Of course it wasn't easy for them. Both of them were tied up with taking care of children who had already started walking and were very restless. Neither Miranda nor Abigail had a car, and neither had a license, so they sometimes resorted to the help of Mason, who after the departure of a friend and the news that Abigail filed for divorce, began to visit them to provide the necessary assistance to play with the children whom he sincerely loved. He was in no hurry to explain himself to Abigail, for he feared that she was still suffering because of Harry's deed, from whom he had heard very little and no news of any substance. Harry arrived in Istanbul and went straight to the hotel where Emily, according to her, worked at the information desk. 
On the day he checked in, there was a different, unfamiliar girl at the desk who didn't answer any questions about Emily, but that didn't bother the young man very much because his beloved might have had a day off. However, she didn't show up the next day and the third. The hotel was luxurious and it cost a lot to stay in it. And although Harry had money, it might run out and he could not wait for new arrivals. After waiting for Emily to appear and despairing of seeing her, Harry decided to spend the evening in the bar just to sit and drink to get rid of his longing for Emily for a while. It was there, in this hot spot, that he saw his one and only, half undressed. She was wriggling around a gleaming pole, stripping. She was as good as ever, but that wasn't what struck Harry. It was the sight of a dozen drunken men devouring her with their eyes, whistling, applauding, encouraging the girl to get rid of the rest of her toiletries. When Emily finished her dance, Harry moved toward her, but the road was blocked by two large security guards. It would be unwise to confront them. Harry decided to wait until the end of his beloved's work evening. He habitually took up his post at the service exit, hoping to intercept Emily. Staying in the hall, where she walked almost naked between the tables, exposed to everyone's lustful gaze, was unbearable. It was a long wait, but when Emily finally came out, Harry rushed to her. My dear, are you here? I've come to see you. Emily, not expecting such a meeting, did not express much joy. Yes, I'm here. Where did you come from? Why? Unexpectedly. The girl was confused. I told you I'd come. I can't do it without you. We'll always be together, won't we? I've left everyone, my mother, my wife, my children. I don't need anyone but you. And you, why are you in this bar? He asked me in a confused way. I dance here, I'm a stripper. Does that embarrass you? Emily regained her fun, playful mood. A stripper is not a prostitute. If that makes you uncomfortable, I'm not sleeping with anyone. We're not even allowed to have personal contact with visitors. And where are you staying? This hotel. Will you invite me to your place? I'm tired and hungry, to be honest. Dancing is a lot of work, but you can give it up if we're together, can't you? I'd do anything for you, anything to make you happy. Well, we'll see if I should quit my job. Emily cheered as she made her way to Harry's room. You've made some money, haven't you? Yeah, well, you've never been poor or greedy. I'm glad you came, honestly. I missed you. Always thinking about that crazy Christmas night. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hugs, kisses later, place your order. Let's pick something not too heavy together. I have to watch my figure. Yes, Emily's figure was in perfect shape. She became even more slender, flexible, and her acrobatic caresses drove Harry crazy. He realized he could hardly go home to his wife and children. Finally, about his beloved, with the God-given woman herself, and let her be a stripper if she liked it. Let all the men look at her, drool and die of envy for the one she is alone with every day. And he, well, yes, he'll be jealous, but Emily is no Abigail, there'll never be peace with her. And someday they will come home, live as a family, and no one will stop them from being happy. The happiness lasted for six months, then Harry ran out of money, and with it his love for Emily. Harry began to hint that it would be a good idea to return home to a place where he could earn money and provide Emily with the lifestyle she needed. Back home. Back to you. My home is here, Harry. I've got work here. I've got money. I've got fame. And what's out there? But I told you, I'll work, I'll provide for you. With what? Vegetables to make soup, laundry detergent to wash your socks. You see, darling, I'm used to all this squalor. I can't stand the thought of this house. No, don't ask me. I'm never going back there. 
But what are we going to live on? I've got nothing left, and I can't get a job at my social status. So come back, Harry. They're waiting for you at home. You won't be homeless. You won't be unemployed. Don't go whining about how you can't do it without me, and you love me and all that. I've heard it, but I've never seen it done. Well, I've seen things that don't make a man look good. You betray your own too easily. Will you betray me too? Emily, if I betrayed, it was only for your sake. And to betray you, my beloved, how can you imagine such a thing? Exclaimed Harry, wringing his hands. I can imagine it very easily, darling. Yes, you sort of love me now, but only because I haven't turned into a pet chicken. The minute you see me in a kitchen apron and old slippers, you'll start looking for another ideal. Don't shake your head. That's just the way it's going to be. Emily waved her hands in the air. You won't walk around in slippers. We'll have a housekeeper, a cook, whatever you want, promised Harry. I was surprised at how pragmatic his beloved, who had seemed a model of carelessness and frivolity, had suddenly become. The housekeeper? I'd have to pick up her slippers, and you'd have to finish your lunches. How much is your salary? What's your alimony? What are we going to use to rent an apartment? Or are you thinking of throwing your family out on the street? Or is your mommy going to welcome me with open arms? Harry, come back here and get some perspective on real life. Emily, but what about then? What do we do, tell me? Harry felt a cold sweat run down his back. What kind of us? What kind of us? Wake up, there is no us. There's you with your problems and me with mine. I'm staying here because I don't see any other option. I suggest you go home and live a normal life. That seems to be the only option too. And mind you, darling, I make a good living, but I'm not going to support you. I haven't gotten to the point where I can pay men yet. It was the end of all hope. Harry still tried to persuade his beloved to leave, tried to find a way to stay in Turkey, but both these options were equally unrealizable. Realizing that he had no money left, only for the return trip, he began to pack, to Emily's great joy and relief. Don't you love me at all? Have you ever loved me? She asked him goodbye. I have. I loved a strong man who could do something, not a whiner begging for love. We had a wonderful time, we were happy, but I can't offer you anything else, I'm sorry. Harry flew home with a heavy heart, so heavy that he feared the plane would collapse under these reveries. He didn't know what he would say to his wife, how his mother would greet him. However, he cared little about that. He had parted from Emily and probably forever. His hometown greeted him with overcast weather, a fine cold rain. It was as if nature, too, wanted to aggravate his despondency. He entered the apartment, empty and apparently for days. Where had everyone gone? Though it delayed an explanation, it was troubling. Dialed Abigail's number, no answer. The phone was either dead or turned off called my mom, Miranda answered right away, but her voice was so foreign and cold. Harry, where are you? I'm home, Mom. Where are you? Where's Abigail and the kids? Where did you all disappear to? We're not in the habit of disappearing. I'm in a sanitarium until the end of the month, and when I get back, I'd hate to have you home. Abigail? I don't know but I don't think she'll be very happy to see you either. I'm sorry, I have to go to my treatments. Wow, his mother gave up on him. His wife probably didn't either. He didn't have his mother-in-law's number, nor did he want to go to her. Abigail might be there, but he didn't want to talk to her in front of witnesses. Neither did being in an empty apartment. He went out, wandering at first without purpose, but then he saw the house where Mason lived. He decided to visit his friend to find out how things were going at work 
and maybe he knew about the changes in his family. Turns out he did. Abigail and the kids were at Mason's house. It was a real family idyll. Mason and the kids were playing on the floor. Abigail was sitting next to him. Not many people paid much attention to Harry's appearance. Abigail, I'm back. Why are you here? He asked his wife. Because I'm with Mason now. Calm as ever, Abigail replied. I filed for divorce. You? You betrayed me? Harry couldn't believe what was happening. Consider it so, if it makes you feel better. Mason has been more of a father to our kids than you have been in six months. Go away, Harry. We don't want to see you. What was there to do? Harry came home without lighting a light, sat in the empty, uncozy, and cold room. That was it. The beloved abandoned, the mother turned away, the wife gone. What's left? Loneliness.